Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm with Wikibon.org, and I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Kelly, who is the lead big data, data now the data quality analyst at, uh, at Wikibon. Jeff, of course, has done a great job. You've seen his manifesto. You've seen his market studies, and, and we've been covering this space, the cube, silicon angle, Wikibon, we've been covering this space for a number of years now, but what we haven't done, and the reason why we're so excited to be here at MIT is really focus on some of the challenging practitioner issues around data quality, and in particular, the role of the chief data officer, which is emerging as an increasingly important role, especially in data-driven organizations. Stuart Madnick is here, he's a professor, professor of engineering systems at MIT's uh, Sloan School of Management. Stuart, welcome to theCUBE. Well, thank you, pleasure to be here, meet you. Yeah, great to see you. Uh, yesterday you gave a talk on the, the state of the, the CD, CDO. I'm very familiar, of course, with the Sloan School. For years, just got very much involved in a number of your activities. Um, uh, some of the CFO conferences that you yeah. guys held. Uh, so you guys do a great job. I've, I've been a big fan of the Sloan School for a number of years, so keep up the great work, I really Thanks. appreciate it. Um, talk about the discussion that you gave yesterday, um, the keynote. Very good. Well, what I tried to do uh, at the keynote we gave yesterday was talk first a little bit about the whole issue of big data, because that's been a, an important driving force in the emergence of the chief data officer. And actually, I go back a little bit in history. As, as you mentioned, Amazing. I've been around for a long time. So I go back several hundred years, <laughs> and I use it as an example to kind of motivate it, a discovery of the microscope which was actually discovered by accident. Turns out the inventor was a Dutch a gentleman, uh, and he was trying to build a way to measure the, the uh, uh, thread count in tightly packed woven thread. And one day he aimed the microscope at a drop of water, and he observed, gee, was there are animals <laughs> in that water. <laughs> now the reason I use that little antidote to motivate it, it's not that those animals had not been there for hundreds or thousands, millions of years it's just we were never able to see them before. And one of the amazing things about big data in general, it's giving us the ability to see things that we never were able to see or understand before. The, and so that's the, the power of big data. It's, it's obviously gotten a lot of both excitement and hype, but also a fair amount of traction in industry. And I, I also like to, <coughs> pardon me, my voice has uh, worked out yesterday quite a bit. Yeah, but. I like to give some examples of, of kind of, I call, insights. Uh, uh, things like, uh, one of the insights I call is, we can uh, see what you're thinking, insights. And this is some work done by my colleague, Eric Bernelson. Uh, he, one of his PhD students, analyzed Google search data, and by using that was able to detect increases in housing prices or decreases in housing prices in major cities in the United States. Because if you think about it, imagine you're a graduate from MIT and you're going to be moving to San Diego. Well, several months before you move, assuming you want to have a house, for example, you start shopping around, looking around. So by monitoring these results, we're able to kind of say, what are people thinking about doing in the future? And we're able to do all kinds of ways to anticipate what people are going to do by observing things they're doing now to indicate what they're thinking about. So those are the kinds of examples of things that there was really no practical way that we could have done these things in the past. So you, are, you, you guys at the Sloan School, you're very data-driven. I've seen Eric's work in the past. You guys love to, to mine data, <laughs> so you take a bath in data, I, I say. Um, and so, I, but I, I like your attitude. A lot of, a lot of times, uh, we've heard this at this conference, people, we, of course we've heard big data, big deal, which uh, Dad was on this morning talking about <laughs> that. I love that line. Um, and you guys have been doing data for a while, but there is something different about this so-called big data theme. A lot of people don't like that word, but, but it, the, with the web scale, it's, it's, it, it certainly feels new, and I think it is new, and the examples that you're, you're, you're giving uh, bring a new feel mm -hmm. to it. Um, but one of the things that we haven't seen is a hard connection between big data and data quality, and that's something that somebody uh, 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 out of the data quality you know, community is going to naturally mm -hmm. think about. So, do you think about that, and how do you think about that? Well, I, I think it's a very important issue. As I, I often uh, simplify it by saying, you know, having a lot of data doesn't mean anything if it isn't very good. And so quality of data is very important. Uh, one of the misunderstandings I think that I, I think some people have is that if you have enough data, then the fact that some of it is bad kind of washes out. 
And I'm sure there are cases that, where that does apply. But, but if you don't really understand your data, there can be systematic misunderstandings that can really distort it. And so we've been talking about this issue of data quality and understanding data uh, for a long time. Let me give you a simple example, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. As you know, we're now working our way out of uh, another housing crisis. We seem to go into housing crisis in this country every decade or two. Well, there's a story that goes back to the previous uh, housing crisis, and there was a headline in the Boston Globe, uh, the second most authoritative source of news <laughs> besides you guys, <laughs> uh, that, that basically said, oh, good news, housing sales have dramatically increased. Well, how do they do that? This is goes back a decade or so, so it wasn't really big, big data, but what they did, they went to the registry of deeds. And as you know, when a house is sold, a new deed is filed. And they merely counted how many deeds have been filed that month, and it was significantly up over previous months and previous years, so the good news was more houses were being sold. The trouble was, is remember, when a bank repossesses your house, <laughs> they take ownership and there's a new deed filed. <laughs> What was really going on was the number of foreclosures was hitting at all-time highs, not that housing sales had increased. Now, the reason I mention that here, as a simple example, how you can have the data, and the, and the mathematics they did was perfectly correct. They added the numbers up correctly, but the way they interpreted what the data meant was totally wrong. And so that's why we believe that data quality is so fundamental. Understanding the data, understanding what it means, understanding the consequences is so critical. And, and unfortunately, uh, it's vastly misunderstood. Well, and so much of that is antithetical to what we hear in the big data world. Jeff and I and, and our colleagues, we travel around and we, 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 we hear from these big data practitioners, these famous data scientists, and a lot of what they do is inference, it's uh, sentiment, <laughs> Um, and it's, it's very fuzzy. Uh, I feel like you and your colleagues are trying to really bring discipline to that, to that fuzziness, you know, the microscope scope <laughs> example that you said. So, so do you feel hopeful? What gives you hope that, you know, this, this new big data theme is not just going to overwhelm us with uh, bad data? Okay. Well, uh, let me, if you, that gives me uh, a good opportunity to go into another recent project we have. One of the things we've been pushing in our own research group here is a notion of looking at big data both bottom-up and top-down. Mm. I think a lot of what you're describing is I call the bottom-up uh, approach to looking at data. Just grind it and grind and grind and see what kind of bubbles up out of it. So one project we just are, are finishing now was looking at the London riots that took place about a year or so ago. And on the, on the top-down approach, we had a theory that we were exploring. And the theory goes as follows. I'll try to say it quickly. Is that in our heads, we have narratives, thoughts. A narrative might be, the police are here to defend us. Another thought might be, the police are here to oppress us. And in fact, we probably have all these thoughts kind of in our minds at the same time. So we did this project, we identified a number of important narratives related to the London riots, and then we tied that to the data feeds, like Twitter's and feed, to see which of these narratives were being reinforced by the outside events and we were able to take this modeling approach of looking at these narratives and how they ebb and flow and relate to reinforce or, or dissipate each other and the data and we're able to basically forecast, in retrospect that is, forecast the, the evolution of the London riots. So our belief is there are some things you probably can get out of just grinding the data. Mm -hmm. But we believe this combined top-down, bottom-up approach where we have a theory of what's going on and then use the data to refine that theory is very important. And, and I think that's going to be the way of the future. NSA PRISM would be another great yeah, example. Exactly. Any polarizing effect, yeah. you know, would be a great yeah. example. Well, that's interesting because it, it, I, I think that's related to the question of correlation versus causation. Yeah. Um, hmm. And in, in the big data world, what, what we're hearing a lot of, of, I guess, big data evangelists say is it, it, big data doesn't really help you answer in so much the why, but mm -hmm. what's happening. Mm -hmm. And in, in big data, in, uh, the, uh, the I'm sorry, I forget his name, but uh, one of the correspondents for The Economist, mm -hmm. his book really focused on, really it's the correlation uh, that, that big data is focused on, mm -hmm. it's the what, rather than having a hypothesis and testing it. So you're suggesting that it's kind of, you need kind of a, uh, as you said, a, an approach from both sides. Yeah. Um, and ha but how do you practically make that happen when you've got, you know, such large data sets, um, you know, you've got myriad technologies you're trying to use, um, you've got different stakeholders. Uh, that, that, that could be a complex process, I would imagine. How do you practically try to make that happen? Well, first thing I want to just 
piggyback on a, a comment you mentioned I think is a sure. very key one, and that's the issue of correlation versus causality. Uh, I'm probably going to get the joke wrong, but there's an old story about if you look at the size of a fire and the number of firemen at the fire, you notice that the, the, the more firemen you have, the bigger the fire is. And so the obvious conclusion is that <laughs> firemen set fires. <laughs> and the more firemen you have, the bigger the fire you have. Uh, I, I, I'm so I apologize whoever first came up with that joke. I'm sure I butchered it a little bit. But, but that's the challenge you have. A lot of times, if you just grind the numbers, the numbers are correct. Just like the numbers I mentioned regarding how say our, our deeds mm. filed in Boston. But understanding what that really means, uh, what is causing what to happen, can, it does not pop out. In fact, it almost always gets hidden mm. in those numbers. So I, I, that's why, and once again, I don't want to be dogmatic. I'm, I'm sure there are situations where the numbers will be self-revealing. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But all too often, you run into these problems of either a causality not being well understood or the numbers give you a distorted result that, that doesn't make sense, or conversely, may make sense, but incorrectly making sense. And that's why we think wherever possible, if there is a, a fundamental theory that is much more solid, so to speak, that's driving it, and you can use the data to either A, validate that theory, or B, in some sense, parameterize that theory. Uh, another uh, project we worked on uh, just a few years back that's kind of related to this was that we were looking at using uh, data and models combined to predict the stability and instability of countries. An interesting, challenging issue. Mm. So this whole bunch of, of things that I think it's hard to do with just the raw data alone. But if you combine the raw data with some fundamental theories of how people, or organizations, or countries behave, you can do a lot more. And that speaks to, I think, the, the, the required skill set in, in you know, the data scientist mm -hmm. or even to some extent chief data officer and pe people who work with data. It's, they've got to have the ability to crunch the numbers, if you will. But you've, in order to build those hypotheses, you've got to have some domain knowledge or domain expertise. Yeah. And once again, I, I have to be careful. I don't want well, to be dogmatic about it because I'm sure there's many, many roads to success and probably equally many roads to failure. Uh, but I, I don't want to kind of push exactly what you said on that view because that's one that we think has been underappreciated and underexplored is combining the domain knowledge with the data analysis to get a lot more out of it. Uh, if, if you think about it, you know, uh, uh, I used the analogy a minute ago of the microscope. If you think oh, much of what happened subsequently in medicine and biology came out of that. Those are fundamental theories over time. Now maybe the initial observations were just random thoughts or random animals in, in a drop of water, but there are often our theories that lie behind it. And one of the things we try to do with the data analysis is try to understand what are the underlying principles, underlying theories that are driving these things. What about the role of the, the CDO? Um, talk about that a little bit. You've got some perspective there. You talked about that yesterday at the, uh, at the CDO event. Um, talk about what is a CDO? What makes, uh, the, what are the ca characteristics and you know, properties of a, of a CDO? What's the history of that role? Sure. Well, a couple things that regarding the history. I forgot the precise year. I think around 2003, we actually found the first recorded uh, CDO. I think it was by Capital One okay. uh, uh, organization. And then someone did a recent uh, data mining experiment using LinkedIn. Uh, the, I forgot the actual number, but the number of CDOs this year compared to last year is up by a factor of five. So, so obviously there's something going on out there. But one of the things we wanted to do in our research here was try to understand kind of how to characterize CDOs. This is the same phenomenon you have with CIOs to some extent. There, there are lots of people in many organizations with that job title or that label on their business card, but often they do radically different things. And so uh, we did a series of things. First, we conducted a, a series of in-depth interviews with about 40 different either CDOs or people who we believe were doing CDO-like activities, even though they may not currently have that job title and try to understand what they were doing. And the outcome of that research, we came up with, I, I often use a joke, if you're at Harvard, you use a two by two matrix. We're at MIT, we use three dimensions. <laughs> uh, matrix. We came up with three dimensions. <laughs> and so the three dimensions we came up with these, with these CDOs were as follows. The first dimension was we call directionality. Are they primarily looking inward into their organization or outward? By inward, I mean, are they primarily looking for ways to improve the productivity, to reduce inventory? Kind of, are they looking more kind of ways to improve 
the operational efficiency within the company, or looking more outwardly in terms of marketing, how to expand the markets, how to build new products, kind of looking at the outside world. So one is the issue of the perspective. Are they directionality largely inward or largely outward? That was one dimension. The second dimension may seem a little funny, but you see why it's important, is the kind of data they're looking at. Are they primarily looking at what I refer to as largely traditional types data, you know, maybe sales data, maybe inventory data, and such? Or are they primarily looking at what you call kind of nouveau data? It could be things like Twitter feeds or mm -hmm. social media or cell phone traffic or location-based traffic and so on. Uh, the reason I say that is, is you might think of traditional data as being kind of traditional. Uh, I would argue most organizations have, have been able to get value out of a teeny portion of the information they already have. And so it's nothing wrong with trying to harvest a lot more value on stuff that you have that you just haven't figured out how to make good use of. And we have lots of examples of that as well. But then we also have the nouveau data. So the question is your perspective primarily in the traditional data or primarily on the uh, uh, quote big data or, or new data? The third dimension, in many ways, I think may be the most critical one for where it's going to go in the future. And that is whether the CDO sees their job primarily as a service activity or a strategic activity. What I mean by a service activity means someone says, I need to know X. Could you please get me that answer? Or can your organization get me that answer? So you're, you're acting kind of responsively to the needs of your organization, which is a perfectly good thing to do. A strategic issue is being able to help your organization, much like my example of the microscope and the water, help your organization to see things and see needs that they are not currently aware of, to help to set strategic directions and new insights for your organization. So if you think of this as a three-dimensional cube, very appropriate. Yeah. I, I think you <laughs> hope you appreciate the connection. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you. If you think about this as a three-dimensional cube, what we did is we identified each of the coordinates at the corners as a kind of role and describe what that role looks like, realizing that probably no CDO is, is solely in one role. There's usually a cluster of them. But mm -hmm. like we asked them, like, what of these eight roles, which the one you see is being the dominant role and mm -hmm. which you see is your secondary and third one? So that's what we try to do, which, because right now there is no uh, blueprint, if you will, uh, for a CDO or even a way for an organization to think about uh, what kind of CDO they might want to have. Well, what I like about that model is it's organic because the, the, the drivers are going to change. The, you know, the sales and marketing organization, you know, you hear about sales, CMOs are going to be spending more on technology than CIOs. Well, that's going to affect the affinity with which the CDO approaches that cube. So, um, outstanding. So, Stuart, while we had you here, I want to ask you because you have deep expertise. If you don't mind me interrupting you, I'm oh, sorry, please. mid thought, because you, 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 oh, hit, yeah. you, hit, you hit a brilliant thought. I, uh, well, thank you. One <laughs> thing I, I should <laughs> pause and breathe. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Allow some filler every because now. Because one of the things we also showed in our chart when we interviewed these CDOs, we asked them a little bit about their career. And often we'll see that they start off largely in this corner, then they end up moving to this corner, then this corner, and the current plans often then move toward this corner. Mm -hmm. So you're right, it is an organic, evolving role. Mm. Sorry. Excellent. No, Great thank question. you for that. Appreciate it. So I wanted to pick your brain because you're very accomplished. You've written, you know, numerous. I think I told you in college. I, I'm, I'm quite certain that one of your textbooks was required reading. Um, and so I'm interested in your current work. You're working on things like connectivity among disparate distributed information systems, uh, database technology, software project management. Uh, let me actually start with database because database was kind of boring a decade ago. You know, you had a couple of companies out there and you had some platforms, and now all of a sudden databases is hot again. What's happening? What do you see in terms of database technology? How is that evolving? What's changing? Well, that, that's a subject for several hours. I'll try <laughs> to keep it uh, <laughs> somewhat focused, and I'll, I'll address it in maybe two tiers, if you don't mind. One tier is one that probably most people already pretty much associate with the big data movement, and that is the, the fact that big data typically involves large volumes of data and, and large amount of processing involved, looking for new kinds of architectures, both hardware and software architectures, that scale, uh, Hadoop and so on. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of activity going on there and, and a lot of either new companies coming out that provide these services. Uh, one of my uh, uh, students is working on a thesis this semester on the idea of uh, big data as a service. Mm -hmm. you know, what would that look like and so on. So I think there's a lot going on kind of at the architectural software hardware level. The thing that I've been most interested in though, if I can go to that level, 
is something that has been around for a long time, but is only now beginning, I think, to be more fully appreciated. And that's what I call the uh, issues involving both integrating and contextually understanding data. That is, when you're dealing with data singularly, with you know, individual slice of data, there's lots involved in processing it. But when you think about it, let me give you an example I use as a, as a challenge question for my students. I say, let's say we want to be able to do things like predict whether there'll be food riots in Buenos Aires in the next month or not. What are things you might want to know? Well, you might want to know is how is inflation going on in Argentina? Or what is the unemployment levels looking like in Argentina? Uh, how are food prices going up and down in Argentina? There's a whole, and what, what's the Twitter traffic saying? Mm -hmm. What is the mood of people? It's the sentiment, right? The sentiment. Any one of those things may be up or down, and the others may compensate for it. So unless you kind of pull these pieces together, you may not get a, a, a picture sufficient enough to do that. We have not solved that problem yet, but this is kind of an example of a challenge mm -hmm. question. The problem is, okay. when you're trying to pull information together okay, from a, a diverse set of sources, you find they don't all mean the same things. And getting the data to reconcile, uh, I think we've heard that in some of the keynote speakers mm -hmm. today, is a problem in the government sector, in the private sector. It's been there for years and years, not a new problem. It just gets worse and worse and worse. I often tell my class it goes back a long way. It goes back to Genesis chapter 11, yeah. Tower of Babel. <laughs> so, so it's a big, big problem. And we've been doing research here at MIT uh, under the name we call Context Interchange to understand the meaning of data in its different contexts and then ways to automatically reconcile it to make it fit together. So, so that's the kind of research that I think uh, I'm refers to in that. Uh, oh, okay, and, and so pres been presumably the the, the underlying architecture of these systems is evolving to be able to incorporate both, you know, that w whatever, you know, traditional data, you know, how did you describe it before, in the nouveau yeah. data. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there are a lot of initiatives in the industry trying to blend those two yep. models. Uh, and, and some purists are saying, no, they're meant to be separate for, for a reason. Others are saying, that's crazy. You actually need them to be together yeah. and you need to increase the size of the, the databases. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, well uh, first of all, a quick comment regarding uh, activities going on at MIT more broadly. As you know, we're one of the, the, the focal points of the, of the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, uh, and Tim Berners-Lee, who heads it up, has been uh, promoting for a number of years now the notion of the semantic web, which really is not limited to the web. It's more the semantics of data, the meaning of data. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, and we're kind of big fans of that idea. So, so I think the idea of being able to understand data and be able to share it and exchange it, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give his pitch, but his pitch is, is to a large extent is that is a tremendous value we have. We have got huge amounts of information out there, most of which is, is either untapped or untappable because we don't know how to pull it together. And I think by keeping things in the, the separate bins, although there are some issues regarding security and privacy, but keeping things in separate bins seriously diminishes our ability to learn things and make new knowledge. I'll give you one example. One of my other colleagues you may, may know is Professor Pentland, Sandy Pentland, mm -hmm. at the Media Lab. And he does a lot of work with mobile technology. One of the things he, he shared with me recently was an interesting project. You know, with your smartphone, it does lots of things, of course. It knows who you call, along with the NSA. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it also, of course, knows your location. Uh, if it has Bluetooth on, it actually knows who I'm sitting next to. Didn't think of that before. Yeah, right. But also, with the accelerometer, it knows how I'm moving. And what they were able to do is instrument it, and watching people's movement, they could detect the early onset of certain types of diseases, particularly uh, mental illnesses of various kinds. You go into your doctor's office for 15 minutes, he gives you his test, not going to notice it. But by monitoring millisecond by millisecond that your behavior, your movement behavior, today is more jerky, more erratic, than it was a day before, you can detect something that neither you nor your doctor know what's going on inside yourself. So that ability to really harness these kinds of almost micro-level details is, a, is an enormous breakthrough that I think It's really exciting. Have. I mean, the, the whole Internet of Things, Jeff's written about the industrial Internet, the whole the Google Glass, the Apple Watch, I mean, this whole wearable computing thing is really the next wave that we could go on. Stuart. If they let me, we get this uh, high <laughs> sign here. We could go on forever, yeah. and if my colleague John Furrier was here, he'd never let you yeah, off. But really, it. it's been a pleasure uh, meeting you, and uh, thanks so much well, for, thank for coming on the Well, thank you for sharing the time with you. Pleasure. Right. Thank you. Keep it right have there, a great everybody. time here in Cambridge. Thank you. Have some nice weather for you. Appreciate the invite. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> wow. it's, it's about 98 degrees here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, all right, keep it right there, everybody. We're right back after this. <laughs>